Hello and welcome to the eighth episode of season five of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 5th of June 2012 and in this episode we have been fueled by a barbecue inside that wasn't on a barbecue um, to give us... <laughs> That's a grill, isn't it? Well, it what the Americans grill. call a grill. Yes. No, Americans call a barbecue a grill, don't they? Uh, I'm really confused now. Don't know, but we're really full of feet. <laughs> <laughs> to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee. Um, we're also going to interview Elizabeth <laughs> Crumback from the California Loco team, Ubuntu Women and the Community Council, and Charles Dr. Chuck Severance from the Dev 8D conference that Mark attended. We will, of course, cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, command line love, and listen to another episode of Tomorrow's Technology Today from the archives. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I am Tony. And with me this week, we have a full house of barbecue fueled Mark. Hello. Barbecue fueled Alan. Hello. And salad fueled Laura. <laughs> and barbecue. Lies. Absolute <laughs> lies. Barbecue fueled There was Laura. very little salad being eaten. There was. Laura has lots of sausage inside her. Right. <laughs> and chicken. And chicken. And burger. So- right. <laughs> Uh, Mark, what have you Hello. been doing since the last episode? Um, as you just mentioned, I went to Dev8 Ed in Birmingham. That's not Birmingham accent. I don't know what that was. Um, no. Right? Uh, was, was and it, yeah, that was, so it was like a sort of developer conference for developers working in education, which okay. is cool. Was and it good, did, yeah? Yeah, it was good. Did an interview, which uh, you'll hear more about Yeah, in a half later. hour or so. A and bit uh, a bit later. I also went to the Southampton Beer Festival. Are we going to hear more about that later? Uh, no. Okay, was it good though? It was very good. Mm, fair enough. Alan? Hello. Hello, what have you been doing other than making inappropriate innuendos? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I was referring to the sausages. Um, it's a family-friendly show, don't you know? The, um, so we have recently put out 12.04, so I thought it was about time to upgrade to uh, Quantal Quetzal. Uh-huh. The, what will be 12.10 12, on 10. my desktop for a bit of fun. Did it know. work? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. is it shiny? There's, because there's not much difference. Yeah, yet. <laughs> it's not all. It's not all um, changed. Much. It's just a new yet. branch. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, mm. yeah, it works all right. Yeah. Cool, excellent. Laura, what have you been doing then? Uh, I updated my blog to a new WordPress theme and thought it would be st- <laughs> stupidly Ooh. thought it would be straightforward because that's what the point of CSS is. That you can just flick things across and it just works. However. Um, I've still yet to go through and make some changes to the theme to make it you, fit. What did you break? I didn't break anything as such, but I did discover a clever thing where if I've got a picture, the following paragraph isn't formatted correctly. Ooh. Ooh. And I think it's something to do with the way WordPress, even in the rich editor, lets you, t- oh, no, in the HTML bit, lets you do a new paragraph without a tag. And so you're going to have to go through and edit all your old posts? Uh, that or add a bit to the CSS. Fun. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Either way, it's going to take a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. Yeah. So, Tony, what have you been up to? Oh, uh, let me think. We, we have a new router Ooh. here at Studio A. Gosh. Yes, a new, a new router. Uh, oh, my Has... ISP, who are O2, sent me an email saying, you, you've had your router for a while. Would you like a new one? Are you actually, have you plugged it in? <laughs> yes. It's, oh, it's just that I didn't get prompted for a password or anything. No, no, we, we, we clever transferred like those settings across. Um, but it, it promised faster speeds and things. And actually it's an 802.11n wireless router. So they sent me one of those for free, essentially. Yeah. Of course, it hasn't mm-hmm. actually increased the upstream bandwidth. So <laughs> whilst you're connecting to the wireless router wow. much more quickly... You, uh, I'm, I'm connected to your router at 65 megabits a second. What's your good. what's your downstream <laughs> bandwidth? Uh, that's your, it's about two to three, <laughs> <laughs> depending on, on the weather. Yeah, um, yeah. So I hope you're enjoying there about the extra bandwidth. <laughs> it's but, got bigger LEDs on it. Yeah, really. Mm. Are they obnoxious blue ones? No, they're, no, they're green. green. They're green. Yeah, but, yeah. it's more it's obvious. Right. <laughs> but yeah, so that's about being the highlight of my last two weeks. So, don't get too excited yeah okay right so let's start off the show then with our interview with elizabeth we have on the line from the united states of america liz crumbuck hello liz how are you Good, how are you? Uh, not bad. Uh, I think we're done with the Jubilee festivities, something you don't have to worry about. 
<laughs> nope, none of that over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to have a, a chat with you about um, about some um, loco related stuff, but I just wanted to start with an introduction um, and find out how you got involved in in uh, Ubuntu because you've been around the Ubuntu. Um, project for a long time i wanted to know how you got involved and um and what you kind of do within the ubuntu project okay um well i guess i, I sort of got involved um first because i was involved with debian uh doing some debian packaging for work and then i was trying to find another distribution to use on my laptops which i could never get working with wireless um and then in, uh <laughs> i decided to try ubuntu and it works on my laptop and it you know, had wireless and all that, so that's really where I started. Um, and then I found, um, through my work with Debian Women, I found Ubuntu Women and started exploring the community um, after joining there. Um, so I think the first thing I was really involved with was the loco in Pennsylvania, where I was living at the time. And when when you say um, you're involved in Debian Women and that, you know, kick-started you into Ubuntu Women, what was the what was and is the, the premise behind Ubuntu Women? Because I think a lot of people may misunderstand or not quite get why it exists and, and <laughs> what it does. Right. Um, so we pretty much um, recruit women um, into using Ubuntu and contributing to Ubuntu. Uh, the project itself is made up of men and women from all around the Ubuntu community. So we pretty much um, find women who are interested and then pair them up with people in the community who can help them get started. So it's really about support, encouragement, and bringing more people in to contribute and use it, and giving them a comfortable environment to do that in. And is that is that something that that you feel is necessary because there aren't enough women, or the women that uh, have tried haven't, you know, found it welcoming, or what, what's the, what's the main driver for for actually trying to do this? I think more generally, a lot of people find joining any open source project kind of intimidating. And so when you couple that with being a minority joining an open source project, it can be even harder. Um, so there are other groups like Ubuntu Youth who try to get students involved because there, is, there can be sometimes a bit of ageism as well in, in open source communities. So Ubuntu Women really just tries to target women in the community to bring them in, whereas youth targets youth and other groups like that. Um, so it's really just building upon, you know, there's already a bit of apprehension and joining and then trying to make it more comfortable. And we work with women because, you know, personally I want to see more women involved and they are a very big group. <laughs> so. You mentioned there that Ubuntu youth is good because there's some ageism in the community. Do you find that, generally speaking, there is still some sexism in the community that Ubuntu women sort of needs to overcome? I think most generally... We don't encounter a lot of sexism in the Ubuntu community these days. Um, most of the people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, they're really great. Um, I think where we do find it is in a broader community. Um, a lot of users assume that everyone who works on Ubuntu is male, so we'll get a lot of, you know, thanks, man. And I say, I'm not a man, <laughs> but you're welcome. <laughs> um, and so, there's, you know, there's, there's little subtle things like that. And there are also other... Um, bigger things that have, that have come up. Um, but the Ubuntu community in general does a very good job um, in good. this regard. So what got you involved we, we do in... We still have things we need to get over. What, okay. got, what got you involved in Debian Women in the first place? Was that your personal experience or just interest? Um, yes, yeah, so I had been involved in Linux Chicks for a long time, mm -hmm. so it felt like a natural progression once I started getting involved with Debian. So... Um, one of the things that you mentioned was that it was the the wider community that that probably has has more of an issue. Do you think this is maybe because within the community we kind of try and uh, remind people about this this code of conduct document that we have that maybe some people don't read very often, but we kind of have knowledge that it exists and you know a, a general feeling don't be you know don't be horrible to people. Um, do you think the fact that there are plenty of people outside our community or in the wider community that don't feel the need to subscribe to that code of conduct is is where that um you know sexist or or um you know non-respectful behavior comes from yeah definitely that is that is part of it um there's other things whereas in, in the ubuntu community we're pretty um good about recognizing contributions of people 
um, and, and highlighting the work of really outstanding individuals, including a lot of women in our community. So when you're inside the community, not only do you feel like you have to abide by the code of conduct, um, you're also being exposed to a lot of really successful people in the community um, who may challenge a lot of stereotypes that people who are more on the outside don't necessarily see. Right. So this this positive reinforcement. What other what other things that on the on the positive side um, does Ubuntu women do to um, make uh, Ubuntu a more welcoming and uh, um, a more pleasant place for um, people in minorities like women? So one of the things we do is we have an informal mentoring program where we pair up women who are interested in getting involved um, with people in the project who can help them get where they're where they're interested in going. Um, we also uh, find that role models are very important. So we'll find women in our community who are already doing really great work, and we'll interview them full, for Full Circle Magazine, or we'll interview them for Ubuntu Fridge, or do something to get their name out there and publish the fact that they're doing really great work. So once people have role models, then it doesn't feel so weird you know, to be entering that space as a minority. Right. That makes uh, so sense. those are two of the main things that we work on. Okay. Um, we also encourage women to contribute to uh, the Ubuntu classroom sessions. So for open week and classroom, we always make sure we directly ask women in the, in the project to uh, uh, do, do sessions because women generally are less likely to put themselves forward for something. And when directly asked, they're more likely uh, to contribute. Right. Do you, do you see any value in maybe some uh, women-only events? I know in the UK we had a, a flossy event I think Laura went to. Um, not this Laura. Not that Laura, the other <laughs> Laura Tchaikovsky. Um, do you see do you value in those kind of you know female only things where um, you know there's there's less likelihood of you know other people derailing things in <laughs> if that makes sense. When I say other people, I mean the other fifty percent. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I certainly see value in those kinds of gatherings and groups, um, but I think enough of them exist at this point that. If, if someone wants to go to a private, you know, uh, event or, or group where there's only women, there are a lot of things available. Um, the really important thing about Ubuntu Women and Debian Women is both projects have key support from key members of the project who aren't women. And for us, having men in the channel and men who are supportive and very, you know, uh, recognized within the Ubuntu community lends a lot of credibility and uh, helps us a lot in, in our projects. So for us, having women-only events uh, doesn't really work. Okay. Um, you're, you mentioned the, the loco you were previously active in, and now you're based in California. Um, I understand you're part of the California loco. Can you tell me something about what the what the California team does, what it's how it's made up, whether you know loose knit or tightly people? How do, how does it all fit together? Uh, so California is a really big state. So. We've got little groups all over the state um, that do things. Uh, they do their own Ubuntu hours, and you don't really need permission to do them. Everyone just puts them in the local team portal and announces them to the mailing list, and they have their own events. Um, so we'll have events. Release parties are all around the state. Um, we also go to a few conferences for year, each year. Um, the big one is the Southern California Linux Expo, which is usually in the winter. So the locals in Los Angeles there will bring a bunch of stuff, and some of us will fly down from San Francisco area and other places uh, to staff the booth at, at scale, um, where we also run an UbuCon the day before the conference. Um, so that's that's a big event we do. Um, what hap in what the past, happens we've gone at a, to the Linux picnic. And, what okay. happens at an UbuCon? Sorry. What happens at an UbuCon? Oh, right. Um, UbuCon is a Ubuntu-specific um, event where we have presentations on uh, getting involved with Ubuntu, Ubuntu in cloud, and other just Ubuntu-specific stuff from Loco team members. So it's a whole day of presentations. Um, and then this time we went out to dinner afterwards. That was fun. Cool. And how, how is the, the team structured? Do you have like a governance board that manages the projects that you take on, or is it pretty much free-for-all, everyone does what they like? <laughs> So technically, we've got three, uh, a leadership trio, which are just elected each year. Um, currently, I'm one of them. And then there's another one um, who's down in uh, Fountain View, which is about 45 minutes south of me. And then we've got another guy down in San Diego, which is very far south. <laughs> um, so we try to grab leaders from all over the state so we're properly represented. And then 
Um, but but in, in reality, the leadership team really just makes sure we have meetings and makes sure announcements get out. Get that, get out. Um, no one really needs our permission to do anything. And it's pretty much everyone just does their own thing. And if there are problems, we might step in, but it hasn't really come up. So, oh, that's good. Um, um, they're pretty casual. Is... Um... How, how do you organize the, the financial side of things? Um, I know a lot of loco teams have um, a real problem um, organizing events if they, they don't have any um, income or way of managing their income. How do, how do you deal with that? So we deal with it by most generally not dealing with money very much. Um, at any given time, someone in the loco may have $100 or less that comes in from donations. Um, like we had a, a volunteer who gave us a bunch of t-shirts once and we said if you want a t-shirt you can give us a donation and we'll use that donation to ship CDs all around the state. So for really small things like that um, we've kept it, you know, it's very casual and as long as it's a very low amount we don't need to worry um, too much about it. Um, there are things um, like uh, booths at, at certain conference, at certain events um, which give a nonprofit discount. So in those cases, the logo team has typically teamed up with other groups in the area, uh, one of which may be a nonprofit who can get the nonprofit discount. So they're act the nonprofit is actually the one who's handling the booth and handling all of the log logistics, and it's their name on the booth. And then we come in as volunteers to help support them. So it really ends up being a booth that's run by the nonprofit with representatives from Ubuntu California and the Berkeley Linux Use group and the San Francisco group and whoever else ends up coming by. So is this a way to um, so those, those, work, around the, okay. work around the system so you don't have to register and go do all the paperwork and the bookkeeping and the taxes and so on? Right, yeah, it makes it much easier all around. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand this, uh, the, the, the team that, um, that you most closely work with is called Partimus. Can you tell me a little bit about what they do in the area? Right, so Partimus is a nonprofit whose mission is to get um, open source software and other free culture into classrooms. Um, we're currently, I'm actually on the board of Partimus as well as being involved with Ubuntu California. So um, we take donated computers um, and then we give a tax, the, the company donating the computers gets a tax write off or individuals donating. So. That's really great for them um, since we're a nonprofit. And then we take the computers and then we put them in local charter schools, which are in the United States, charter schools are semi public. Um, they're sort of an experiment by uh, the educational world in trying to think of yeah, different ways. Yeah, I think we've got something to... similar. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Yeah, so they're, they're semi public. If they get public funding, um, there's a raffle, anyone can apply to attend them, but they're pretty sought after, so it can mm. be hard to get into them. Um, but as far as we go, um, they're not uh, bound by restrictions that normal public schools are here in the United States. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy around funding and uh, what kind of software can be brought in and what kind of software is approved. So it's really complicated to get into traditional public schools. Right. So we work with charter schools who have a lot more funding flexibility. Mm. And we'll bring the computers in, and we'll hook them up to the network. And in most cases, these schools never had computers before. Um, wow. And so the computers run Ubuntu, and they um, we have, we have lots of different types of deployments. We've got labs, which are centrally managed by a server, mm -hmm. and then we've got um, a project in the works that's just um, like 20 laptops that gets moved around to different uh, classrooms. And those don't necessarily have to be formally networked. They just have pretty vanilla install of Ubuntu on them. It's fascinating um, that so you say that there is... It's fascinating to say that there are schools who haven't had computers before. Yeah. I think even the, the poorest school in the most deprived area of this country, the, you know, a government-funded school, has some computer presence. Um, is it common in, in America for that to be the case? I don't know about common, um, but California in particular has pretty bad schools. Um, we're some of the lowest rated schools in the country, and uh, there's not a lot of funding that goes to them. And particularly in the case of charter schools, since they can decide where they put the money, they rather put the money towards hiring better teachers um, and, and getting um, upgraded facilities, which don't necessarily include technology. So do you think that makes um, Ubuntu an attractive option for them because there's a lower cost associated with it? 
Um, not just Ubuntu, but the fact that we bring all the computers in for free. Mm. So the hardware is free to them, the software is free to them, and um, we also do maintenance on right. the network and everything. Um, so we're the ones running the Ethernet cable and uh, doing all that. They usually negotiate an Internet connection because in a lot of the schools, maybe a teacher or two may have a computer, um, but in the, it's just the students that don't have them. So they may have an Internet connection already. So um, oh. we just leverage that and we come to deploy our own system. Uh, typically, how old are the computers that you're providing to them? I'm sorry? How old do the computers tend to be? Just a oh, three-year-old? Or? How old? Um, so currently, the lowest spec computer we'll accept is a Pentium 4 with a gig of RAM. Mm -hmm. So we'll take anything above that, uh, that or above. And do you ship stock Ubuntu? Do you fiddle with it? Do you... Uh, lock it down in any way. Do you, you know what? What, what can um, a student expect as, the, as their experience? So it really depends on the school. Um, the one school where we had a, a pretty successful lab, um, we used an imaging server that would image all the computers, and it would set a default administrative account and a default student account that was all managed through Open LDAP. So that was. The student account was pretty locked down, doesn't have administrative functions, the GNOME panel is locked, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they can't really mess it up a lot. And then the administrative account can pretty much do anything. Um, beyond that, we also had classrooms where we really would just install default Ubuntu and put on a pretty uh, background or something that's applicable to the school. Cool. And then, uh, do things like we'd, we'd install Flash or install uh, Java and tune it up so they could use the Java applications that they might be using. Right. Um, but it really depends on the school and what their needs are and what their infrastructure looks like. And do you get any feedback from the students? Are they happy with this experience? Do they say, oh, no, it's not Windows? Or, you know, do they, do they actually use them? <laughs> yeah, so most, most people who are using them, they think it's fine. Um, uh, the kids are very, the ones we're targeting, uh, elementary and middle school, um, they can adopt, adapt to interfaces faster than the teachers can. So <laughs> they don't care what they're using. And a lot of the applications they're using at this point are Flash and Java-based and their web apps. Right. So they fire up Firefox, which they would do at, at home, um, if they have a computer at home. Um, and it's, it's just a web browser, so it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Brilliant. So if anyone wants to find out more about passing most of the work you do and uh, uh, the, the school's... Uh, projects, but uh, where can they find out more? Um, the website is just uh, partimus.org, and that'll have links to the projects we're working on and information about the project, and as well as uh, a link to our blog, which is where we really update most of And people can donate as well to finance your work. Yep. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, we have our, our federal tax ID number on the website, so if anyone in the U.S. is donating, they can get... Uh, tax exemption for their donation. Fantastic. Yeah, even better. It's been lovely to speak to you, Liz. Thanks very much <laughs> yeah. for taking the time to talk to us. Yes, thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye. bye. It's time for some news. <laughs> it's that time again. Humble Bundle V, or 5, is now available containing four games and a bonus fifth if you pay over the average price. For the first time, it's also available to install via the Ubuntu Software Center. Yes, it is. All of them. Uh, of, course, of course I bought it, yes, like I have every other Humble Bundle. <laughs> have you played it? I've played some of them. I haven't played all of them because mm -hmm. some of them require decent 3D card and my laptop only has a little Intel thing. Yeah. But, um, Limbo's really good. It's really nice little... little yes, game. I just played it. It's good fun. It is, yeah. And being in the uh, software centre is quite good. Yes, and that's good, isn't it? Yeah, so you can add them to all your machines if you want to. Can you oh. pay... Can you pick your own price if you're buying it through the software centre? No, you buy... Well, not not in this version. I think uh, we don't have that, that facility yet. So you, you still go to thehumblebundle.com and you go through the normal buying process where you allocate how much money you want to go to yeah. the developers and the charities and so on. And then after you've paid, right. you then see a button that says Software Center, and it takes you to a web page with links to installing all the um, the games. It's cool. Mm. Cool. Well, it's not quite all the games. One of the games isn't in the repository yet because it's huge. <laughs> 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 Having some trouble there. Well, fair enough. 
The judge in the case of Oracle versus Google has ruled that APIs cannot be copyrighted. Hooray! <laughs> this is good news, isn't it? It's very good news. <laughs> and all claims of copyright infringement against Google for its use of the Java API have been dismissed. This is fantastic news, but Mark, tell us why. Well, basically, if APIs were copyrightable, then if you wanted to make... Well, for a start, it would mean that things that Google did, where you do like a clean room implementation of an API that already exists so you can write your own software without having to license the original stack it runs on top of, you wouldn't be able to do that. But it would also mean that you'd require a license to write a plugin for a system with an API, which would basically just completely destroy a lot of software ecosystems. Excellent. <laughs> that they have sorted that out. Well, sort of. <laughs> Mozilla, has, uh, Mozilla has announced that it will resume producing Firefox mobile builds for the ARMv6 processors found in lower-end smartphones. Interesting. Mm. Is, mm. Does mine count as lower-end? Yes. Yours is <coughs> very as does my, Yours is the, the predecessor to mine, and mine has this processor which right. they're talking about. This is the same oh. processor um, era or um, revision that's in the Raspberry Pi. Ah. Yeah. And interestingly, one of the reasons that they said they're looking at it is because basically most of the phones that are sold in China and other emerging markets have these processors. Right. And so uh. if they want to really, really expand with the mobile browser, then they need to support that phone, those right. phones. So it's the, the iPhone 3 era of, uh, of CPU. It's that kind of spec um, um, that a lot of these phones yes. are. I don't know a lot about yes. iPhones. No, the iPhone okay. 3 has the same right. kind of spec as Good. the Raspberry Pi. So it's oh, similar, really? Similar. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Law firm Berman de Valero, Valeria has filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of Facebook's shareholders with the accusation that it misled the marketers to the company's value in its recent flotation. Launching at $39 per share in mid-May, the company's stock has fallen to around $27 per share. Mm. And there's allegedly some naughty things that they yeah. did which uh, if they artificially did do them, inflated the price. Quite naughty. Or at least stopped it dropping. <laughs> don't, don't you think uh, Facebook would be able to hire a vast swathe of lawyers that prove that they didn't do this thing? Or Well, th I think this particular law firm has been successful. I can't remember which company it was against, but it was another big company who had a similar situation before and they were successful. And what's the outcome? Is it just you, you pay some remediation to the, to the participants of the... Um, of the class action lawsuit, yeah. or uh, yeah, know, basically, if, if it, it's not going to reverse the IPO or anything stupid like that. No, I think if they if they rule in their favour, then anyone who was affected can basically say, "Yeah, me too," and they can claim some compensation back from Facebook. I think yeah. that's the way it works. So all that money that Facebook is now not worth, they have to pay to somebody yeah, else. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. I also yeah. saw a, an article uh, where some leading analyst was saying Facebook Facebook will be gone in five to eight years' time. Which, given you know, given what's happened to things MySpace. like MySpace, Bebo, Orkut, and you know the social buzz diaspora, yeah, wave, <laughs> wave. It's inevitable, really. Whether that five to eight yeah. years is is yeah. accurate or not is you know, well, five to eight years is a very long time in the internet. Yes, we've been doing this five years, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long time. Some of us have. Uh, the Flame malware targeting Windows computers has been found to be able to propagate between computers by making itself appear as signed Windows software and installing through Windows Update. Microsoft has since released an update to mark the certificates uh, used as untrusted. Oops. Ooh. Yes, pretty bad when you can make your malware appear to be signed by Microsoft. Yeah, so it wasn't actually signed by Microsoft, but it appeared, it appeared to be like it looked like it was. Yes. So they've revoked the certificates that it I think, appeared to have been signed by. I think they've I think so. they've um, blacklisted the authorities which the certificates were reporting to be signed by. Right, <laughs> if you okay. understand cryptography wow. and SSL and the uh, SSL, is that what I'm after? Mm. Yeah, maybe. Yes. Then yeah, this will make a lot of sense. Otherwise, it probably won't. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for taking part. <laughs> <laughs> the internet's Brian Lunduk has kicked off a campaign to open source his own code if he receives enough donations and subscriptions. Brian started the scheme last Monday with a deadline this week, which has already been extended as the target of $4,000 has not yet been reached. It's an interesting proposition. So mm. what's the software? So he's made a bunch of software. There's a couple of games. Um, there's a an app developer environment, like a graphical app developer creation kit thing uh, there's a comic reader and a couple of other things as well um and um yeah he's he's asked for a subscription of four thousand us dollars per month 
not one person to pay that. <laughs> yeah, a Co- number pe- of people. Enough yeah. people to yeah. collectively. Because yeah. this is at the moment, it's basically his business how he makes his money. Yeah. So, so he sells the software. So he's asking for people to subscribe a certain amount every month, totaling four thousand mm-hmm. dollars, for him to continue to work on the software, but to release it as to open continue work, Yeah, continue working on that software. And I don't know if he mentioned all new software as well, but mm. at the moment, it's existing software. It's an interesting model. It is. Because even once you've started it, what's to stop people cancelling their subscriptions? Yeah, and the code's already out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it's also interesting that the the code that his stuff is written in is um, real basic, which is non-free in itself. So the, the, or at least some of it is written in real basic. So even if it were open source, there's no way that most distros could actually ship uh, binary packages because they they don't have Ah. the build tools to build yeah software so hmm. how useful this would be you know if it, if it was written in c or c++ or python it might be more useful arguably uh than it currently is but it's worth watching and see if yeah this succeeds and whether other people might be able to make a go of this as well certainly hasn't got off to the best start if he's extended his um no but i mean he's already, got three and a half, he was over optimistic perhaps uh, and it was an arbitrary date he said i think it was three and a half thousand dollars he got to in a week oh well wow yeah <laughs> that's not far that's off not bad is it but that you know that that needs to be maintained. Yes, because mm. that's only one month of his rent. You know. So. Yeah. Mm. Fair enough. And events. There is Og- only one event. <laughs> Literally, only one event here. that's worth knowing about. <laughs> Og Camp. That's Og Camp uh, is happening. When is it? It's in August, the seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth. That weekend. Isn't that it? weekend. Yes. So it's what. Ten weeks away? Something like that, yes. Ooh, don't say Good. it like that. <laughs> Good maths. Um, yeah, and it's in Liverpool, and we've told you all the details before, and you can find more details at ogcamp.org. Um, but we've got some uh, some exciting updates to update you with this have week. We, Mark? We okay. do. Excite we, me. Um, as with last year, we're going to have um, several tracks. So one of the tracks on the main stage is going to be scheduled, and the other tracks are going to be open for everyone to come and give their talks Um on the day or uh, as they as they wish in a sort of bar camp style exactly similar to last year that bit isn't it Mm. um and we have the first few speakers confirmed (sighs) for our scheduled track oh go on tell us who it is mark uh we have alex martindale do you need a drum roll too late for that Uh, do you you have a do you have a drum roll queued up (laughs) (laughs) we have alex martindale who is going to be talking about the uh, the History of Errors, I believe, was the title of his talk. Cool. Um, Sounds excellent. interesting. Uh, we have another drum roll, please, Maestro. Oh, you want one for everybody? Okay. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is that going to reach out too much time? It's really loud. We have uh, Alan O'Donoghue, who organised Hack to the Future. Cool. Um, I won't bother with more drum rolls. Uh, we have <sighs> Ross Gardler. Who... Oh, poor Ross. Didn't get a drum roll. <laughs> Give him a drum roll. Oh, no. <laughs> What's he going to talk about? Drums? Uh, in true bar camp style, Rolls. he's going to decide closer to the event. Okay. Uh, okay. He like, is on the board of the Apache Software Foundation oh. and does uh, quite a lot of community stuff like that. He's a yeah, good speaker. Yeah. Uh, and finally... Do we is that your way of saying another drum roll? Yeah, please. Well, I old machine here. We have Lindsay Anderson, who's going to be talking about the Broadband for the Ru- Rural North project. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Yes, it is. Because we're, we're going to the Rural North, aren't we, for Odd Camp this year? What, Liverpool? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's really rural. It's in the north. It's not quite north. It's all fields up there. It's north. So, yeah, um, the details about them and their talks and when they're going to be talking will be on the website. And we will talk, well, announce other speakers in future weeks. I think I still need to book a hotel. Yeah, don't forget to book the hotel. The don't details are that. on the website. Yeah, for it's that getting as well. booked up. You've got to call Janice between the hours oh, that, of half that's 10 why and I half 11 on a Monday. <laughs> no, you don't. You just phone up and tell them and it's fine. It's the phoning okay. part. Yeah. Let's right. sort that out and then we can see you there. You just really? phone someone in America for an interview who you've never met before. Why can't you just phone someone in Liverpool? I don't like phone, talking on phones. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. And uh, we'll one. see you at our camp, hopefully. <laughs> If we book. And now the triumphant return of Command Line Love. Hurrah.
Good stuff. So what are we loving this week? So um, it's a very simple command. It's R. Madison. R. M. A. D. I. S. O. N. Who's he? Okay. And um, this, the reason I discovered this is that um, I was asking our good friend and uh, ex-colleague Dave um, to... Dave te- Walker Dave? Yes. Oh, uh, right. I asked him for some help getting a package into the repository and um, in Ubuntu. And um, he, rather than... When I asked the question, is it in the repository, rather than tell me the answer, yes or no, he echoed the, the output of, <laughs> of a command at me, which, which is good. Slash he, exec he, O. Well, no, he was teaching a man how to fish rather yes. than giving me the fish itself, which I would much prefer. And the then fish, telling you effectively to fish off. Well, I've now got content for the show. So it's <laughs> a double whammy of excellence. So R. Madison, um, you just type R. Madison and then a space and then a package name. Um, so, for example, R. Madison space Firefox. And it will tell you uh, what releases of Ubuntu has that package mm. and the version number of that package and what architectures uh, it's available in and which part of the repository is in. So if you ever wanted to know, oh, well, what version of Firefox is in Lucid and is it, you know, universe, is it in main or is it, you know, is it compiled for ARM or not? You just run ARM Addison Firefox and you get a whole load of output that tells you exactly what versions of the package are in where. It's really cool. And who controls which repositories it looks at for that information? Is it just uh, the ones that are available on your system at the time? I think it queries your... I don't know. Is it okay. I, I was going to guess, but I'm not going to. Okay. Um, but you, I think you can override all of that kind of stuff. There's loads of command line options. Um, you can give it a URL um, to go to. So you could tell it to go to the Debian repository, or you could tell it to go to a, you know, some... Um, other, other place other place <laughs> other the than internet. the default but the default seems to be there's probably a config file in etc somewhere but yeah it works cool excellent well thank you for that command line love that's all right I'm here at Dev8 Ed with Dr. Chuck Severance. Good evening, Dr. Chuck. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. Great to be here. You enjoying the event so far? Oh, yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Um, Now, Chuck, you're a man of many hats, one might say. You've done a lot of things. You've got a lot of roles in a lot of places. Uh, One of the things you're probably best known for is um, your work with Sakai. Right. You've written a book about um, the Sakai project. So some of our listeners might not know what Sakai is. So do you just want to start by telling us a bit about what Sakai is and how it came to be. Sure. Sakai is an open source learning management system like right. Blackboard Learn or Moodle. Mm-hmm. Um, the, f- the formation of Sakai was a little different um, than, than any other open source in that Sakai was funded in 2004 from the Mellon Foundation right. with a grant to bring um, four universities together to build in a team way, a single learning management system for themselves. Right. And so the Mellon Foundation, in effect, created a family. Mm-hmm. And um, we really functioned very much like a family, which means we agreed on some things. Yeah. We disagreed on other things, and we had to get through. And so the it was um, it was like a marriage. It was, a open, it was an open source project and known to be open source, but we'd all agreed that whatever we collectively produced, we would all use. Right. And... Um, and so that is a little different than most open source that yeah. starts by one or two individuals who make something and then they open source it and then a community grows around it. We basically started with a very specific goal in mind and we had to achieve that goal according to the grant. Yeah. So we were under a little more pressure and in a little more of a hurry than most open source projects when they're getting started. Yeah. So what was your role in this family to begin with? So I was the chief architect, yeah. which meant that... Um, a whole bunch of developers reported to me, and then I wrote it, reported to a board, an advisory board of directors. Uh-huh. And so I was where things like the buck stopped here. Yeah. I was the one that said no. Mm-hmm. I was the one that said yes. I was the one that made lots of final decisions on the technical and um, feature directions for the project. And um, and so I, I did that. I, I kept making lots of decisions, and I... Um, tended not to want a slipped project, and I wanted to meet our deadlines, and uh, and it was it was actually quite stressful. That, that's the reason that I wrote a book about it. I wrote yeah. a book because it was kind of like nobody, no school, not 
MIT, not Stanford, not Indiana, not Michigan. No school wanted to be seen as not holding up their end of the bargain. Right. And we'd made an on paper commitment. And so it was like, it was like the pressure was on, but there was very little degrees of freedom. But mm -hmm. we, I think something amazing cool. with that much pressure. So as, um, as uh, well, I suppose no, no product is ever finished, but from what came out of the project um, and your involvement in it, what, what does it have that would make, uh, make an institution use it over some of the competing products that were already out there? Right. So it's kind of like, what are the advantages that yeah. Sakai has? Um, so so I, I might start with some of the disadvantages of uh -huh. Sakai. Um, until very recently, Sakai was missing what you'd think of as a structured content feature that mm -hmm. Moodle would call activities, Blackboard would call content. And we just finally got that in 2012. Right. And that's eight years later. But finally, the Sakai 2.9 release is what to me was its greatest weakness has finally been addressed in the version that we're working on and should be releasing. Um, so that that's the weakness. Thankfully, it's addressed in our next release that puts Sakai nicely on par with most of the mainstream features that other learning management systems have. But you say, okay, here's this learning management system, and it's not necessarily the technically best or the best set of features. Why do people like Sakai? What kind of schools like Sakai? And I would say that um, the profile of the schools that choose Sakai are schools that want to really control their own destiny, schools that have an agenda for their learning management system. Some schools just want to download something or to buy something, plug it in, turn it on, watch the database, hope that they have enough hardware, and get through a semester, then get through another semester, and then maybe upgrade over the summer, and complain to their vendor that they don't have features that they don't like. That is not how a Sakai school works. Uh -huh. A Sakai school says, my learning management system is essential and strategic, and I'm going to play with it. I'm going to listen to my faculty. I'm going to add things. I'm going to take things out. I'm going to change its look and feel. And we have a way of thinking at University of X, and we want Sakai to look this way. And, oh, by the way, we don't want to not be able to upgrade. We want to be able to tweak Sakai in a myriad of ways and then still be able to upgrade. And so Sakai was really written by people at some of the top 50 universities in the world, and they're all kind of hackers. Right. So they built collectively the most hackable learning management system on the planet. And so that's what people love about Sakai is the fact that you can bend it and morph it and turn it anywhere from a, a research group support tool to a teaching and learning tool to a distance education tool by like plugging and tweaking and shoving and bending. And so it's just kind of like this silly putty kind of a piece of software. And when people download Sakai, they see that it has like, I don't know, 1,000 options. And mm -hmm. they go, oh, this is terrible. Well, then we put a thousand little switches in because every school wants, some schools want to do it this way, some schools want to do it that way. Okay, we'll put a switch in. Uh, here's another problem. Oh, some schools want to, so we have a thousand switches. And that's because we don't want people modifying the code if they can at all help it yeah. when they have all this flexibility and all this dynamic stuff that they want to do. We want to make it so that they can keep upgrading and, and share the code. And so it was, it was again, very different than most open source things where there's one or two individuals that are like the visionary of it all and that flows out through the product. It's really a very much collective thing of these top 50 schools. Cool. Now Sky is obviously something that you're very passionate about. I am. And um, you're actually quite a remarkable person in, in your field in that you've actually got it tattooed on your arm. I do, sitting right here. Um, now, there it is. That, the thing is that it's not the only tattoo on your arm. So nope. do you just want to tell me about the tattoos and what the significance is? Sure. So the center of the tattoo is yep. Sakai. Yeah. Because that's the center of my universe. That's kind of where, where it all comes from. Mm -hmm. That's where all, it's all born. Um, directly above the Sakai is the logo of the IMS Global Learning Consortium. Right. Which is the standards organization that builds uh, interoperability standards like Question Test Interoperability, QTI, IMS Common Cartridge, IMS Learning Tools Interoperability. And so it's sort of like I went from Sakai 
In 2007, I resigned in Sakai. That, of course, is in the book. And I started working from 2008 till, till the present um, at IMS, and so I put this IMS logo on. Mm-hmm. Then the rest of the logos are the, the, the first eight vendors that complied to the IMS Learning Tools Interoperability Specification. So that includes Blackboard, Desire to Learn, Genzabar, Instructure, Moodle, Learning Objects, and OLAT. So each, as each one of those learning management systems was certified by learning tools interoperability, then I would get a tattoo of all of them. And there's one blank space left for the, the next one to get certified. So what, um, why do you think that something like learning tools interoperability is such an important thing to have, that you would get tattoos on your arm? Well, uh, the simple answer is that learning tools interoperability is going to change everything. Mm-hmm. Is going to change everything about teaching and learning. Um, historically, from essentially 1997 till 2010, 2011, if you wanted a learning tool, you simply had to wait until your vendor provided it for you. Right. You maybe could add an extension or whatever, um, but you just were at the mercy of the provider of your learning management system. And the providers of learning management systems, whether it's Moodle or Blackboard or Sakai, or anybody, they, they have to balance priorities. They're not going to put every feature in. Mm-hmm. If they put every feature in, the thing gets too big and it explodes. And so an individual school or an individual faculty member often has something they want, and they just can't have it. Learning Tools Interoperability makes it so you can build capabilities outside in cloud-hosted or locally hosted. You can build a tool outside the learning management system and then trivially plug it in. But what's cool about it, is all these learning management systems have plugins, but they don't have a standard plugin. Yeah. Tools interoperability is the standard plugin. So there's innovative products. Piazza is a good example of a really cool threaded discussion that a lot of faculty members really love. Mm-hmm. Piazza is a little tiny startup company. They started making this cool threaded discussion, and it uses tools interoperability. And so it doesn't matter. They could walk into a Moodle school and plug it in. They can walk into Desire to Learn school. They plug it in. They walk into a Blackboard Learn school. They plug it in. On and on and on and on. And so. What this does is it's the beginning of what I think of like an app store for education where right. a teacher, much like we do on our mobile phones, just like, you know, I'd like one of those. And then like minutes later, you have one of those yeah. as compared to I'd like one of those. And then a year later, maybe you have it or maybe you don't have it. And so it means that the innovation, pace of innovation is uh, far more rapid. And there's the creation of a market for someone who can build a tiny, small tool extension and then make money on that without having to build an entire learning management system and then compete straight up with Blackboard Desire to Learn, Sakai, or Moodle. Right. Cool. Um, now, you mentioned there about uh, one of your career moves in the past. Uh, now, in the over the past year, uh, you, you took what some might have considered a slightly uh, unexpected career move in that you uh, started working for Blackboard, who not only complete, compete with Sakai, but are viewed by some historically as sort of the the bad guys of the uh, the VLE uh, ecosystem there's been some you know patent infringement cases in the past and so on um so how did that come about and what are you now doing at blackboard so <clears throat> yeah that 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 uh that seems like an illogical step but uh for people who know me it's actually a quite a logical step um i don't believe that open source is the natural enemy or proprietary software. If you look at the relationship between um, <clears throat> IBM and Linux or the relationship between IBM and Apache web server, you see uh, situations where IBM is making lots and lots of money off of Linux. Yeah. IBM is making lots and lots of money off the Apache web server. And IBM is giving back to the open source in a healthy way. And certainly in 2005, 2006, Blackboard was pursuing a uh, sort of an aggressive win-lose strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we in Sakai found ourselves on kind of the receiving end of that of that win-lose strategy when the the patent uh, Sakai was never sued um, for the patent, but we were afraid that we were going to get sued. And so we spent a lot of energy sort of fighting to protect ourselves from the thing that we thought could happen any day. And um, that resolved itself. Uh, for Sakai in February 2007, when Blackboard issued what I think may be unprecedented, which was a grant of immunity to that patent to any piece of open source software, 
commercial or otherwise. Sakai didn't ask for an exemption for itself, yeah. nor did Moodle ask for an exemption for itself. We asked an exemption that was much broader, any open source, commercial or otherwise. And so Blackboard uh, gave, gave us that uh, you know, immunity from that patent, as well as Moodle, Atutor, OLAT, and any other open source product that comes along. And during that time, Blackboard bought WebCT, then they bought Angel, and, and yeah, Blackboard seemed like the heavy yeah. in the marketplace. And so what's changed? So I would say kind of at some level, Blackboard probably learned from the mistakes that they made. Mm -hmm. the, the, patent, the patent attack didn't do them, didn't work out so well. Let's hope that Blackboard is smart enough to learn from its mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, but really for Blackboard, it was a pursuit of standards and interoperability as a, as a, as a general strategy um, that started when Ray Henderson was hired. But the other thing that was sort of happening inside of Blackboard was the, the notion of purchasing companies and then trying to assimilate them seemed like it wasn't such a great strategy after all. And, and so the idea that kind of grew inside Blackboard, I, don't, I wasn't part of these discussions, but it was really evidenced by the March 26th announcement, was the next time they purchase somebody or some company or some product, that don't try to assimilate them. Let them continue to operate independently. Mm -hmm. And so on March 26th, Blackboard um, purchased uh, Moodle Rooms, which is the world's largest Moodle provider. NetSpot, which I think is the world's second largest provider out of Australia, decided to, instead of trying to merge all the Angel features into the Learn product, it's decided to continue the Angel product for the Angel customers, mm -hmm. um, extend its life. And um, they had a learning management system called Edline, which is um, very popular in K-12. Um, and then they wanted Sakai, and they wanted to come up with this five learning management system strategy. And they wanted to make it so that after they purchased Moodle Rooms, that, that they would continue to function inside the Moodle community the same way they had before, in a respectful way, contributing in a positive way, supporting Martin Dugiamas. And then they wanted to do the same thing with Sakai. And the, I, the Sakai community towards the end of last year was kind of starting to run out of resources. Right. And I was getting kind of frustrated. And I wanted to work on Sakai, and I didn't. Nobody would pay me to work on Sakai, and I, I couldn't find any friends to work on Sakai <laughs> that I could convince to work on Sakai, without me paying them. And as Blackboard was coming up with this sort of more inclusive multi-learning management system strategy, I ended up with a conversation. Um, it actually started with a tweet on February fifteenth, where I was really frustrated, and I said. I'm sick and tired of all this. I just want someone else to raise money and give me the money and let then they can take credit for all the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And I got a text from a 202 area code at that point and the text said you will soon work for me. <laughs> and 202 of course is Washington DC in the United right. States of America. And I at that point at that point, I could have said no, but I, but I was getting what I wanted. I yeah. wanted to be able to work on Sakai. I wanted to be able to invest in Sakai. I wanted to make Sakai better. And having Blackboard become sort of a com commercially involved in Sakai was just icing on the cake. And placing Sakai in this 5LMS strategy that included Blackboard Learn, Angel, which I love Angel, uh, Moodle, and Sakai, and this headline. And it's like, wow, this is a great team, right? I I love the notion of stabilizing the learning management system marketplace by having these five learning management systems coordinate. So all the all the hoping and praying and begging I had done in previous years to get tools interoperability into one or two learning management systems, now we have one vendor that can put learning tools interoperability in five of them just by waving their hand and go poof, they're going to all have it. And frankly, a school can have two learning management systems. I don't care. A school can not switch. A school can keep their old one as long as they want a school, because the new tools are going to be outside the learning management system. 
And so me becoming in Blackboard, me becoming involved in Blackboard was both to save my precious Sakai, yeah. move it forward, but also then move the whole marketplace forward. And that's what, you know, I hope in a year or two we will look back and say, yep, things are different. There are ways that people are making money. There are innovations that are happening, and it's really cool. Right. Um, well, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, but is there um, is there somewhere that people could go to find out more about Sakai and about uh, LTI? Um, yeah, they, certainly you can go to the sakaiproject.org for mm -hmm. Sakai. Um, the, uh, so the site to learn more about uh, learning tools interoperability is www.imsglobal.org. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Cheers. It's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Yep. Yes. Yes, it is. And we start with news that Canonical, my employer, are <laughs> debuting at Computex in Taipei. What's that? It's a massive trade show, like the biggest one in Asia. Cool. So everyone who's anyone is there, and we're there. What is being... <laughs> <laughs> we aren't there. No, we're I mean, here. Well, yes. What is being debuted? Um, so on the first day, I think the... Um, uh, Ubuntu for Android, the converged device, we call it. The oh, yes, Ubuntu for Android is it. going to be demoed um, at a media gathering. Mm. Um, and uh, Mark Shuttle is giving a keynote presentation as well. And mm -hmm. I think Ubuntu TV is going to be there because I know Will Cook, Ooh. who works on Ubuntu TV, is out there. And uh, I've seen a photo he's taken where there's the Ubuntu TV in the, um, uh, what do they call the booth. Thing. Okay, yeah. Excellent. He's all set up, so they're showing that off as well. Mm. Mm. So, interesting. Mm. Progress. Yes. Interesting stuff. Want to see Ubuntu TV? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can check the code out and play with it yourself. Yeah, I don't want to see it that much. <laughs> is Ubuntu TV kind of like Myth TV or is it something that's part of the hardware? So the the long-term goal is it'll be baked in a telly. You walk into a shop, okay. buy a telly, and it'll have Ubuntu TV in the telly. And there'll be lots of different tellies from lots of different manufacturers, all with the same Ubuntu TV, and it's all... Um, Canonical all takes good. over the world. Yes. One TV at, <laughs> at a time. time. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Excellent. Okay. David Wonderly has clarified the position on Kubuntu. Yes. This is a... in terms of the uh, use of the name Kubuntu by the Kubuntu project, yeah. since it has been harshly jettisoned by the <laughs> evil overlords at Canonical. <laughs> Actually, the... actually, it was, yeah, the, the post quite interesting in that it actually clarifies exactly what has changed canonical wise yeah. it is actually still sponsored by canonical in that canonical still provide them with a lot of the infrastructure hosting they, yeah, and hosting and build machines and all sorts of stuff like that and trademarks well yes and the, the kubuntu trademark which is quite See, a big one a lot of people have been you know saying oh well that's not really very much you know anyone can host it host a couple of isos on a website but there's an <laughs> awful lot more to it than that the you know the build farm that builds all the packages for KDE and Ubuntu and LXDE and yep. Ubuntu. There's a fair amount of stuff going on there and, mm. and sysadmins are paid to look after this stuff. So yeah, there's a fair amount of stuff. And it's it's good that David's blogged about it to, you know, clarify exactly what the position is and yes. Who that, looks after which bit. I get the impression there have been concerns that they might need to change the name of the project if there were problems in that relationship between Canonical and the Blue people. systems. Blue system, all the people who you know, the wider Kubuntu community, but it doesn't look like that'll be the case. No, so that's no, all right. I think that's a problem. Cool. Next up, uh, the Ubuntu Vancouver Loco team members have written a getting started guide for Ubuntu Unity. Yes, in the form of a PDF. Yes, it's quite. Um, there's a, it was an old one that they've sort of um, decided was very out of date, and so they redid it. Is that correct? Yeah, they've updated. They, they'd written one for eleven oh four, I think, and they've updated it for for twelve oh four. And um, yeah, it's 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 not huge, um, but it's a yeah, it's a getting started guide. I like the uh, idea of it simplifying your life. Yes, that's the sort of subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully it will. Alan isn't the only one foolish enough to be playing with ButterFS on Ubuntu. Oh, who else has joined this club yes. then? <laughs> so um, George Castro also has an HP oh. micro server, 
And uh, I mentioned... That he doesn't want. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he also wants to lose data in. Yes. <laughs> um, and I was chatting to him about it at UDS, and I mentioned that I was using ButterFS on mine and uh, how I loved it. And um, he said, yeah, I'm going to give that a go, because he's been having problems with um, software MD RAID. Right. Um, and it, it just got annoying enough that he decided to try ButterFS. And that's got to be pretty annoying. <laughs> if you'd want to try out an experimental file system with your data. Um, yeah. So there was a great post on the kernel or the ButterFS uh, mailing list. Somebody who shifted loads of data onto ButterFS. That was five terabytes, wasn't yeah. it? And then so it seemed to be working. So then he deleted all his backups. <laughs> No. And, and then, then it, it went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> then it broke. It's easy yeah. to laugh at other people's misfortune, so let's do that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally about your own. a whole show of that. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, in the bit about Ubuntu. Uh, PC World have an article about Ubuntu OS for smartphones may come as soon as next year. Ooh, this Ooh. isn't the converged device. This is actually no. Ubuntu on the phones, phones. Yeah. as opposed the, to ios or android or as opposed to android Nokia with, shipping with these days. yeah so the thing that's yeah. been shown off that you've seen the videos of and mm. you've made videos of um is um a phone that is running android but has ubuntu on top so you can use it as both a phone and a desktop computer and, yeah yeah and, and all that this article is speculating about whether there will be an ubuntu smartphone next year mm-hmm. yeah interesting Interesting. Watch this speculation. Yes. <laughs> okay. And finally, in the not about Ubuntu, um, the Fedora project has announced that it will be paying uh, to have their distribution signed by the Microsoft Evil Empire Keys, making it bootable uh, on systems with restricted UFEI bootloaders, which is required by the Windows 8 certification. And um, speaking for Fedora, Matthew Garrett, everyone's favorite angry man, said uh, <laughs> it's not an attractive solution, but it is a workable one. So this is opposed to getting people to turn off UFI protection in their BIOS. Because can that you would do be that? Too, too. You can. Yeah. Um, the the Windows certification thing has said that if you want it, if you want it certified to run um, on ARM, you can't let people disable the uh, secure boot. Yeah. But on x86, they didn't say that. So yeah, which is interesting, given on ARM you don't really have a BIOS. So yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't be, you know, I'm not sure how they, whether, you know, how they would implement that. But um, yeah, so Fedora looking into uh, a way of complying with this. So it'll mean that Fedora could boot without people having to poke around and monkey around exactly on yes. a Windows 8 certified yeah. machine. That, I mean, that's only the goal. for as long as Microsoft say it's okay. <laughs> so yeah. the, the goal is you want to be able to get a Fedora CD and boot off it and install on your machine that, that came with Windows 8 and had this certified platform. Yeah. Um, if that's your goal, then that that's what they want to achieve. Yeah, which you know it makes sense, um, and I'm sure I d- I don't know, but I'm sure other distros such as ourselves and others are looking at ways to to do this as well. Mm. Yeah, so he's yeah. going to have to hit all distribution people, mm. distribution manufacturers. Yeah. Surely, at some point, it becomes an EU point of interest or well, competition. Yeah. Mm. yeah, you'd like to hope so. Yes, you I would. Mean, when you said about them not being not doing the kind of you're not allowed to turn it off thing on x86 i wonder whether that's to try and get them out of any problems with that potentially mm. but then it's up to it's up, isn't it up to the 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 bios vendor the the hardware vendor as to whether they actually implement well, yeah, that or yeah. Not. yeah they to, could to they sell could just yeah. not well to sell yeah to sell you don't have to be certified to sell a machine with windows on it it doesn't have to be certified hardware but but then that certain regresses. people won't buy Machines, that, machines aren't that aren't certified. Exactly, and it goes back, regresses back to the, you know, you're having to go and look up machines in hardware compatibility yeah. lists yeah. And, and buying bits and pieces that you know are compatible yeah. that don't have this on, like individual motherboards from like eBuyer or something and building your own machine rather than just walking into a shop and buying a machine that, you know, you know it will work on because... It's going to make buying laptops a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, watch this space, really. Okay, uh, so that's the end of the bit about and not about Ubuntu, and we will now tune in to an edition from the archives of tomorrow's technology today. Hello. 
and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire. It's good day to my delightful co-host, Miss Deirdre Morris Oxford. Good day, Douglas. With what are we going to begin today? Well, Deirdre, there's a revolutionary device for water divining below ground level using an ingenious system of magnets. We invited the inventor, Mr. Bertram Flimsy, to tell us about his invention. But he refused to talk to us. He refused to talk to you, Douglas. Well... Why is that? He used to be my old housemaster at school. Why specifically won't he talk to you? Ah, I set fire to his trousers in third form. Genius. Thank you, Deirdre. What do you have for us? The latest prediction from the Natural History Museum in London is that its scientists will soon be able to recreate long extinct species from deceased bone matter. Why then, let's go over to our correspondent, Telemachus Whitby Standish, at Regent's Park Zoo, where I believe he is in the lion enclosure. It appears we cannot bring you Mr. Whitby Standish's report at this time. We do apologise. Perhaps we can use that scientific technique to recreate the extinct Telemachus Whitby Standish, Douglas. <laughs> Why is that funny, Douglas? <laughs> yes, we've been told to put more humour into the show, Deirdre. I would have thought one standing joke was enough, Douglas. That's all from tomorrow's technology today. Tootle Pip and God Save the King. Really, Deirdre. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed for that. I love her. She's great. <laughs> <laughs> Guffawing all over the studio. And I thought I thought I had Those heard... sausages again. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I had heard the uh, line, let's go over to our correspondent for the last time this weekend, after all of the TV coverage of the Jubilee stuff. Oh, here um, we go. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I see, but no one's hadn't. mentioned the Queen. Oh. oh, nearly made it through to the end there, Laura. <laughs> That's good. We need to get mentions in because I want to put a Jubilee-related title for the show. There you go. Right. We need to talk about the Queen and the fact that it was a diamond Jubilee. (sighs) Right. Um, That was fun. Right. Any of you got anything else to say? (laughs) No, keep digging. There's more barbecue left. There isn't. No, we've eaten the whole thing. (laughs) You did. Thanks. for. uh, (laughs) That is all for this episode, however, so thank you for listening. Um, You can find out how to get in touch with us on our our website. If you go to the website, podcast.obonti-uk.org, um, it's got our voicemail numbers up there and Twitter feeds and Google Plus and Facebook and all these sort of things and IRC channel. And you can send us feedback. And then if you send us feedback about the show or Ubuntu or the community around it, what we might do is read it out on the show. Or if you send us a voicemail, we'll never we can change anything. We can play it out on the show. <laughs> and then you get a little bit of reflected glory. He's ad libbing now, isn't we he? We did get one feedback this show from someone called David. Oh, yes, that's right. He thinks I sound like Rose Tyler. I'm guessing he's not English. Are you talking about the same Rose Tyler? (laughs) I think so. Are we talking about Doctor Who? I think so. Rose Tyler being the blonde one, what's her name? With the Billy Piper. Billy Piper, (laughs) The one who doesn't have a northern accent. accent. (laughs) Yes, well, you know, that's good. But any other feedback you can send us, (laughs) the ridicule, yes. Yeah, maybe that's what... You can suggest someone Alan might sound like. (laughs) We all know who he looks like. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Oh, dear. Right. (laughs) Um, yes, yeah, but we will be back in two weeks on Tuesday the 19th of June um, for our next live episode. Um, so you can join us then. And we, we may or may not have a barbecue before that one. <laughs> Depends on the weather. <laughs> Definitely no jubilees. Definitely no jubilees. Yeah. Or queens. Or maybe diamonds. 60 years of achievements compared with our five. <laughs> yes. See you next time. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.